So, there's a question about the chain rule. So let's do an example like that. So then, can you, can you recall for me what it actually was? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Find f prime of x. OK. So then, now, this is the way this goes. This right here that I'm writing down, this is the chain rule. The derivative of f evaluated at g of x okay, is equal to, is equal to what? f prime evaluated at g, and then multiplied by g prime at x. OK? So then in this particular question, the one that you're asking me, what is g? 3x to the fifth, right? This is g. This is, this is that. And what is this thing right here? What is this? That's all of this, right? this whole business. OK, so then now, what is g prime? 15x to the fourth. OK, so then now, basically you have an equation with several terms, right, in terms, and you're given n minus one of them. So then you need to find the last one. OK, so then you have, right, the left-hand side is the left-hand side. So then what you have now is that 8, 8 x cubed, Right, should be equal to f prime evaluated at g of x times f times g prime evaluated at x. Okay, so you know g prime. So then 8x cubed is f prime evaluated at g of x. You know g prime, it is 15x to the fourth. Okay, so then I can divide both sides and get something great, right? So then 8 over 15 times 1 over x equals f prime evaluated at g of x. And so what was the question? To find f prime of x. Okay, so now someone give me a hint. Plug in g of x. To where? This is where you got stuck. <laughs> you were able to make it this far. Okay, so let's think about it. So someone give me a hint. Hmm. Well, we do have g of x. All right, so then we know that this, in turn, is equal to f prime evaluated at, uh, what am I trying to say, 3x to the fifth. I'm not sure what you're asking. No, no, you cannot. Hmm. And you're sure what they're asking for, they want this, f prime evaluated at x? Oh, that's an interesting question. Where do you take it from here? Let's think about this for a second. So I haven't done this one, so I'm going to have to think about it for a second. So if I say that, if I say that y is f of u, d, y, d, u is Okay, dy, du, and if 
I say that u is g of x and du dx is... Do you have something? Yes? Okay. The numbers were a little different? Okay. I s maybe. I don't know. So I think I'm getting pretty close to it here. So d, d u d x u is this. If I could get f prime evaluated at u, so f prime evaluated at u d y d x. So I want this one. So f prime evaluated at u. F prime evaluated at u. Hmm. So the answer is is I'm not sure what to do here. And I'm on, I've been put on the spot, and my brain is refusing to work. So what I'll do is I will consider the problem and write up a hint, and then post it. Okay? It's a good question, right? If it can put me on the spot and make me feel nervous. <coughs> Other questions? Okay. So then let's continue. So at the end, what did we do at the last time? Ah, right, I didn't make a recording last time. It was in that other room. So we had just finished related rates. Our just, we had just finished implicit differentiation, right? And I had said that uh, I had made a specific example where I had said, OK, if I draw a circle, right? but I don't actually draw a circle. I give you a circle. And I say that there's a point, and it's moving around, and it's on the circle. Okay? And it can't, it can't leave the circle. Right? It can move around, but it has to stay on the circle. If this point is right here, and it is moving left, then if its horizontal direction is left, then its verti vertical direction of travel must be what? Up. Couldn't possibly be anything else, because if it wasn't also moving up, then it would be leaving the circle. Right? So then various situations like this are very important okay, in the thing that we're about to do, that the SIGN of your answers needs to be correct. Okay, so here's an example. What if, what if uh, someone is in an airplane and their altitude is represented by a variable y? Okay then maybe the airplane during part of the flight they're going up you know they're gaining altitude some of the time they're losing altitude so at the time when they're gaining altitude dy dt will have what sign positive it will be positive because that's saying that the altitude is increasing at that time okay and if the airplane is lowering its altitude for for a moment then what will be the sign of dy dt negative Okay, because that's, that signifies that the altitude is decreasing. So then here's a very common error that I get on the next section we're about to talk about. It is, I'll say something like, someone is in an airplane, and then they jump out because they're a, a, you know, going to use a parachute. Okay, then I give you various situations, and then I say, compute dy dt at this moment. And then someone tells me, well, the person jumps out of the airplane, and then dy dt is equal to 100. No, 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 no. If dy dt was 100, they would have jumped out of the airplane and then proceeded out into space. Okay, is that the way it works? No, that's not the way it works, right? It's not the way it works. So, so if someone's jumping out of an airplane, their altitude is decreasing, right? That's a physical, a physical important thing. <laughs> So you can't tell me that dy dt is positive. If you tell me dy dt is positive, in that case, that means that you have fundamentally misunderstood the problem at hand. Okay, and you will be, you will be punished severely for your, for your answer. Okay, similarly, similarly, what if, what if I have a bucket with no holes in it whatsoever, 
and I start pouring water into it, and I'm measuring the height, and I call the height has variable h, then what should the SIGN of dh dt be? It should be positive, because that signifies what about the height? It's increasing, right? So if I give you a bucket with no holes in it whatsoever, and I'm pouring water into it, and you tell me that dh dt is negative, you're telling me that as a result of your pouring water into the bucket, the water level is decreasing. Okay, and if you tell me that, that means that you have fundamentally misunderstood what is going on. So does everybody see the SIGN of these things is of paramount importance? Okay, good. So then, <clears throat> what we're doing today is called related rates. This is section 2.6. Related rates. Okay, so then, <clears throat> so then, let's make a remark about what this means. So there's two words, <laughs> right? There's the word related. Okay, all this means is it means an equation. or equations of several variables. Okay, so then rate means derivative with respect to T, where T is understood to be time. Okay, so then I would say, as far as being descriptive and accurate, it would be better to call this section, you know, equations. <laughs> equations and time derivatives. That's a much better name for this. It's much more descriptive. However, related rate sounds cooler because in most languages, English very much included, we like to have phrases that all start with the same letter, right? Where all the words start with the same letter. What is that called incidentally, linguistically? Does anyone remember? Alliteration, right? We love that. Related rates. It sounds cooler than equations with time derivatives. Okay, great. So any question about the meaning of this section. So the way this is going to go, the way this is going to go is basically I will give you some kind of word problem. From this word problem you will construct an equation or two, possibly more, but probably just an equation or two. And then you will com perform some kind of derivative. And then as a result you will have an equation involving n quantities and I will give you n minus one of them. Some way or another. You have to find the last one. Right, so I'll say, blah, 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 find quantity A. And I gave you all of the rest of the n, n minus 1 of them. Does everybody see the idea? Okay, furthermore, all of these equations, all of these situations are going to somehow be related to some sort of geometric shape that you already know, like a circle, or a triangle, or a rectangle, or a sphere, or a cylinder, these kinds of things. Okay, so then your, your knowledge of geometry is going to be necessary in order for you to solve these problems rapidly and accurately. Okay, so any questions about that? Okay, wonderful. So I hope that you're not too <coughs> worried about it. Okay, let's, do, <laughs> let's start out with the very worst one, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> Okay, now, the one we're about to do, you know, at this university, you represent just 50 or 60 students or whatever that are taking Calculus 1. That's just in this class. There's more at this university. But the truth is, is that tens of thousands of students are taking Calculus 1 right now. And I would say probably about, at this point in the semester, about 5,000 of them, at least half of them, have done this question right now. <laughs> okay, so it's awful. I can't even tell you I can't even tell you how many times I've done this question. Okay. So here we go. A ladder <laughs> is leaning leaning 
against a building. Right, the ladder is a fixed ladder, it cannot change length. The ladder is of fixed length. Uh, let me think about it for a minute. About uh, 25. Wait, let me think about it for a minute. Pretend you can't see me writing this. Okay, so then 7. That would be 49, and then 12, that would be 144, 180, no, that's not one of them. Someone tell me a Pythagorean triple. 7, which one? Ah, no, wait, here's one. This is the one I was trying to think of. 5, 12, 13, right? So 25, and then 13. Okay, so then imagine, imagine that you can't see this writing up here. <laughs> okay, so it has fixed length 13 meters. Imagine that you can't see my writing up there. Okay, a ladder is leaning against a building. The ladder is of fixed length, 13 meters. The foot of the ladder is sliding away. From the base of the building. Okay, it's sliding away from the base of the building. Find the rate at which the vertical height of the top of the ladder is changing. at an instant when the uh, horizontal distance from the building to the foot of the ladder is 5 meters, and has rate 0 0.2 meters per second. Okay, so that was a lot of writing. <laughs> okay. So since this is the first one, I will do it without too much input from you. So now, the way these go is you basically always need to draw a picture for two reasons. One reason to aid in your understanding. A second reason is that is how you will receive partial credit. Okay, you're not going to receive credit for just pulling things out of the air. Okay. Now, here's a building. Okay, and here is the ground. So this is the building. Oops. <coughs> and this is the ground. And there's a ladder leaning against the building. <coughs> so something like this. Okay, now conveniently, right, we're making the assumption, right, that the building is, a, is at a right angle. Okay. So that, what kind of shape do we have going on here? A right triangle. Do you know some things about right triangles, including equations? Yeah, you know some things about them. Okay, excellent. So, now, what is the length of the hypotenuse of this triangle? 13, I agree, but how did you arrive at that conclusion? That's the length of the ladder, right? Do we need to give it a variable name? Okay, if you say no, then you need to tell me why. Because it's not changing, right? It has fixed length 13. 
right, if I gave you a different ladder question, you know, because some ladders can change, right? They can get longer and shorter and things like this. Then it would need to be a variable. But this is a fixed length ladder of length 13. Okay, now. I use these words, right, that sort of assume that you have some a little bit proficiency in the English language and ladders and blah, blah. I said something about the foot of the ladder. What is the foot of the ladder? The mm -hmm. bottom, right? This is the foot. And what is the top? <laughs> the, the, the top? Okay. Right. I just want to make sure this is clear. English is not everyone's first language in this room. Okay. <coughs> now, it says, the foot is sliding away. Okay, the foot is sliding away. So then that means that this piece is moving to the right. Does everyone see that the foot is moving to the right? So then the top of the ladder is moving in what direction? Downward. That means that whatever we use to measure that height, its time derivative should be what? Negative. If you tell me that its time derivative is positive, that means that I am moving the foot of the ladder away from the building, and that is causing the top of the ladder to move upward. And you have fundamentally misunderstood the situation. Okay, that would be like you be working for a business and saying that, you know, all we have to do to make money is this, and actually that's going to lose you money, and then after a few weeks you'll be fired. Okay, good. So, we need to come up with names for the various quantities. Okay, the foot of the ladder is sliding away from the base. Find the rate at which the vertical height of the top of the ladder. So, the vertical height. What, what measurement is the vertical height? Where is it? Right, it's, it's this. Right? That's the vertical height. What do you want to call that? Y? H? Okay, we'll do H. H is fine. Okay, so then now, that's one variable that we need. Okay, what's another variable that we need? So the vertical height, blah, blah, top of the ladder, when the horizontal distance from the building to the foot of the ladder. So that's something else that we're measuring. Okay, that's something else that we're measuring. Oops. So what do you want to call the horizontal distance? What do you want to call it? Okay, X. I'll just go ahead and say it. Fine. <laughs> Y'all aren't being very cooperative today. Okay. <coughs> now, it says find the rate at which the vertical height of the top of the ladder is changing. Right? So then now we need to turn this into a math sentence. Find what mathematical symbol? Not dy dt, nothing is y. DHDT, right? Find DHDT at an instant. So at an instant when, when what? When X is 5 and DXDT is 0 0.2. So now, any time, any time that you are given a rate, you need to very carefully consider the physical situation, and you need to determine you need to determine the SIGN. So, should dxdt be positive 0.2 or should it be negative 0.2? Okay, I agree that it should be positive 0.2, but now you need to explain to me why it should be positive because it's getting bigger. Right? The distance is getting bigger, so it needs to be positive. Okay, so find the HDT at an instant when blah, 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 blah. So then now, remind me again, what was the name of this section? Related rates. Okay, so probably I would say that we have satisfied the rates portion of the name of this section because we have said, find this rate at an instant when you have this measurement and this rate. But we probably haven't satisfied the related part of the title yet. Now, relation is just a math synonym for what? Equation. So what I need is an equation involving all of these things. So can you think of one? Right, the Pythagorean relation. So then let's write that down. 
So then specifically, right, we have h squared plus x squared is 13 squared. Okay. So now I have an instruction that says find the h dt. I have an, I have an equation involving h, so what shall I do? Differentiate with respect to t, right? I want dh dt, I differentiate with respect to t. What if I want a dh d theta? Differentiate with respect to theta, right? Good. So then dh dt so can be obtained in the following way, d dt h squared plus x squared is 13, uh, the derivative of 13 squared. Okay, now I did the joke last time. What is the derivative of 13 squared? Zero, right? It is not 2 times 13. <laughs> okay, so then, as for the left-hand side, you will get 2h dh dt plus 2x dx dt. Okay, now I have an equation involving how many unknowns, right? So one thing that I'll note is that I can divide by 2. Right, so I'll go ahead and do that now. dh dt plus x dx dt is 0. All right, so I did that. Now I have an equation in involving how many unknowns? 4, right? So then one of them is the one I want you to find. So, logically, what must be true? I must have given you three of them. Okay. So then, I'll, we'll start plugging in here. We know, uh, well, don't know what h is. And dh dt is a thing we're looking for. And then plus uh, x, we said, was 5. And dx dt, we said, was 0.2. Okay, so then that's zero. So then I can say that after rearranging a little bit, h dh dt is equal to negative one. Ah, oh, but now I have two variables. And I need to find the last one, but now what? Ah, you can figure out h. Right, I gave you enough to figure out h. How do you figure out h? The Pythagorean theorem, right? Because if you just scroll up to the top, what's h? <laughs> it's 12, right? That's that one, the last number that I said that I wanted you to ignore. Okay. <coughs> so then, from the Pythagorean theorem, right from here, we can make the determination that h is 12. <coughs> so, we can finally say that, okay, in that case, 12 dh dt is negative 1, so that dh dt is negative 1 over 12. Okay, now anytime you, you end, anytime you end a related rates question, you need to look at all of the rates. Now what is this saying about dh dt? It's getting smaller. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. If I had made some kind of arithmetic error, something like this, and it, and it was positive, then I would look at that and say, okay, I have, I have now making the claim that dh dt is positive. And I look back at the picture and, and ask myself, okay, if it's positive, that's telling me that h is getting bigger. Is h getting bigger? No, 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 it's not getting bigger, so I must have made an error somewhere, so I'm gonna go through and find it. Okay, good. So does everybody understand the these kinds of questions now. Okay, now we're going to do just many, many different kinds of examples of this, but we're going to do it much more rapidly because I've covered basically all the salient details now of this. Okay, so any questions about it? Okay, <coughs> let's go. So here's another example, so I'll describe it aloud first. There is a pool of water that is very large and it is perfectly calm. It has no disturbance in it whatsoever. And then I come by and I drop a rock in it. Bloop. Okay, and then as a result, as a result, there is a circular wave that is propagating outward. Right? So then it's a circle. Do you know some equations involving circles? Like their circumferences and their areas and whatever? 
So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to say that there's some sort of circular pond. So not a circular pond, but there is a large uh, pond with a calm surface. And then I say at time zero, zero, drop a rock into it, so into the pond, making a circular disturbance. Okay, one thing that's interesting but not so relevant is this, is that as long as the pond has a, has a depth that is constant, what will be true about the propagation speed of the wave? It will also be constant. That's pretty interesting, right? At least I find that interesting. Okay, so then <coughs> that's interesting because you might think, well, at the beach, you know, if you're way out away from the beach, the waves don't ever crash over. You know, but when the waves are coming up to the beach, the waves crash over? Why don't the waves crash over in the middle of the ocean? And the answer is because as the wave comes up to the beach, the depth of the wave is decreasing, and that causes the top of the wave to move faster, and it crashes over. Okay, so then, at time zero, you drop a rock, it creates a circular disturbance. <coughs> so, part one, find the rate at which the area of the circular disturbance is changing when, uh, we'll do a couple things. Uh, so it is at an instant when the diameter of the disturbance is how about 12 meters and the wave is traveling at 1.5 meters per second in all directions. Okay, so first things first, we should draw a picture. Okay, so then, a circular disturbance, what is the shape? <laughs> a circle, good. Okay, wonderful. <coughs> so then, we know, we'll choose just the typical names for a circle, so then this measurement that I'm indicating right here, this is called the what radius, and the usual name for it is R, good. Okay, so then you can see that we're talking about area, so we need the formula for the circle of radius, formula for the area for the circle of radius R. I'm going to branch out and say that I'm going to call that A. Okay, so then now, what is the formula for the area? Pi R squared, very good. So A is pi r squared. So now, that is the equation, and a synonym for equation is relation, right? So then now, we translate this, translate this into the following math problem, from a word problem to a math problem. Then, the instruction is to find, okay? So it says, find the rate at which the area of the circular disturbance is changing. Okay, so what is the name of the math symbol we want? DADT. Find the ADT at the instant when what? When what? Radius is, ah, uh, but, but I see 12 there. Wait, wait a minute, it was 6. Right. What, did, what, what did I give you? I gave you the diameter the diameter, right? So that's when 2r is 12, 
right? So then everybody, does, does everybody see the little games that are played? I give you the diameter instead of the radius. Okay, when 2R is 12, and I have this other number, 1.5, what is that? That's dr dt is 1.5. So should it be positive 1.5 or negative 1.5? Which one? Positive, and tell me the physical reason why. It's getting bigger. Okay. So then now I have an equation involving A. I need something to give me dA dt. So then you can do that by saying that dA dt is pi times pi times 2R dr dt. Okay, so then now I don't even need to solve anything, right? The one that I gave you had dA dt on the left already, so dA dt is pi multiplied by 2 multiplied by 6 multiplied by 1.5. Okay, so then that is what? This is the 318 pi. <coughs> okay, so what does that tell you about the area? It's getting bigger. Now you think back to the problem. Should it be getting bigger? Yes, it should be getting bigger. Good. Any questions? So another thing I can say is find, so this will be part two, find the rate at which the circumference is changing at the same time, so at the same instant. Okay. So, what do you think? Need a new need a new relation, right? Need a new equation. So, what is it? Circumference, we'll say that starts that's going to be called C. So, what is the formula? 2 pi r. Right? So, then if it's C, what are you supposed to find? What is the name of the symbol we're looking for? dc dt, so dc dt is 2 pi dr dt. Okay, and so that's 2 pi times 1.5. So then that's just 3 pi. That's just 3 pi. And that's really actually pretty interesting, right? The fact that circumference and radius are linearly related by 2 pi. So let's think about this for a minute, just to, just to kind of work your imagination for a minute. Imagine that I took a string, or a pipe, or whatever. Yes. Imagine that I took a string, or a pipe, or whatever, and I made it... Oh. Okay, so then I think it's going to crash now. Sorry. Okay, so then I'll, I'll, keep <laughs> I'll keep telling my story. Imagine you have a string, and it's going around the Earth, okay? That's a really long string, right, all the way around the equator. That's okay, because I save it a lot, so I probably didn't lose too much. <coughs> Today is, what, the 8th? How much I did lose? Blah, 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 blah. Nothing! <laughs> okay. So, if you have a string that's going all the way around the Earth, it's, it's tens of thousands of miles long. Okay? Tens of thousands of miles. Now, what if I want to do the following? I want to increase the length of the string so that I can hold it one foot, one foot off the surface of the Earth. Right? Try and imagine how much longer I have to make that string to make it one foot off the Earth. How much longer do I need to make it? 6.28 feet. That's it, right? 2 pi. <laughs> Can you imagine, right? Thousands and tens of thousands of miles long. And I want to make it long enough so I can make it all be one foot off the surface of the Earth. Just 6.28 feet. That's how, mu that's how much longer. <clears throat> so think about that at home. So any questions about, any questions about this?
<coughs> this last example we did, so let's do another example. <coughs> okay, so let's do one that is slightly interesting. Let's see, I gave you the airplane one, so I can't do that one. Did I give you the boat one? No, let's do the boat one. Okay, so then I'll read the instruction aloud. It says, it says, a boat is pulled into a dock by means of a winch that is 12 feet above the deck of the boat. Okay, so there's a boat in the water and there's some kind of dock and the water is perfectly still, right? It doesn't have any disturbances in it and the boat is being pulled toward the dock. Okay, so then here's a picture that goes with it. Okay, so here's the dock. And here's some kind of winch. Okay, and then here's a boat. Okay, so then... Oh. Okay. Got a nice boat here. Excellent. Okay, so then there is a rope which is connected from the winch, there's a rope connected from the winch to the boat, like so, okay? And then there's, you know, the boat is in water, so it's like this, water. <laughs> That's a pretty good boat. <laughs> okay, so then, <coughs> so then now here to here. Okay, so then can everybody see the, the shape that's coming into play now? Okay, so then now, I'll, now that we have a picture to look at, I will continue reading. It says, A boat is being pulled into a dock by means of a winch that is 12 feet above the deck of the boat. So there is some measurement that is 12. What measurement is 12? It's the height, right? So then this, I've extended, this is the height of the deck of the boat. I extended it forward, right? So it's this, it's not, it's not this distance from the dock to the winch, it's the distance from the winch to the height of the, of the deck of the boat. Okay, so then I'll indicate that here. And so this is 12. The winch pulls in the rope at a rate of four feet per second. Okay, so the winch is pulling in the rope. So then that's telling us about one of these measurements. Which measurement? This leg or this hypotenuse? The hypotenuse. Right? So then this, this has a rate of, it says, pulls in the rope at a rate of four feet per second. Now, is it four feet per second? No, it's negative four feet per second. Why is it negative? Because that measurement is, is getting smaller, right? The rope is being pulled inward. So then the length of that measurement is negative, right? Nowhere in the, nowhere in the word problem did it say it's negative. No, it says four feet per second. So you have to look at the question and say, ah, it's negative because that quantity is decreasing. Okay, rate of negative four feet per second. It says, determine the speed of the boat when there is 13 feet of rope out. And so then it says, determine the speed of the boat, boat when there is 13 feet of rope. Okay, so if we're going to do that, we need to come up with names for all of these quantities. What would you like to call the horizontal distance between the boat and the dock? X. That sounds good to me. What would you like to call the length of the rope? S. S was the first one I heard. That's fine, too. S. So then now let's turn this into a math statement. Determine the speed of the boat. 
Okay, so then that means find a particular math symbol. What math symbol? Find the x dt at an instant when what? What is 13? Not x, s. When s is 13, and we need another piece of information, what? ds dt is what? Negative 4. Okay, so if we're going to do that, we need an equation that relates all these things. So can you see that 12 squared plus x squared is s squared? Okay, so then if you do that, you compute the derivative of this. <coughs> So, the derivative of this is the derivative of s squared. <coughs> so then, 2x dx dt is 2s ds dt. Okay, so then we know we know s and the s dt, and I can divide both sides by 2, so I can say that x dx dt is equal to 13 times negative 4, which is what, negative 52? Okay, now how can I figure out x? The Pythagorean theorem. Right, so in addition to that, I can figure out that x must be what? 5. Okay, so anytime you have a triangle, a right triangle, and you see 12 and 13, you should be thinking 5 also. What if I give you a right triangle, and you see the sides 3 and 4? You should be thinking 5. What if I give you sides 6 and 8? You should be thinking 10. What if I give you sides 25 and 24? You should be thinking seven, <laughs> right? So then all these things are called Pythagorean triples. They, they're just, they're so common in math problems, it just is in your interest to memorize the first few ones. Okay, so then <coughs> five dx dt is negative 52. So then dx dt is negative 52 over five. So then what does that tell me about dx dt? Uh, what does that tell me about x? It's getting smaller. So that means if that's the case, then the boat should be getting closer to the dock. Is the boat get, is it getting closer to the dock? Yes, it is getting closer to the dock. Okay, good. So the last one I want to I just want to mention. I'm not going to do it. I just want to mention it because things can get a little more involved. So for example. Uh, the very first example in the book, the very first example in the book is an example about a cone that is point down. So it's like a, one of those cheap paper cups that you could go up to a water fountain and get some water and hold it, right? But you could, I don't like those because you can't set them down because they're, you know, they just flop over. Okay, so then, <coughs> now if we have such a cone, you look at it from the side, it looks like a what? A triangle. So a very typical question is something like this. I could say that, okay, the water level is this, and then someone came by and poked a little hole in the bottom, and water is coming out. Right, water. Everybody get the general idea? So if water is falling out, then the height of the water should be what? Decreasing. Okay, <coughs> okay. So then now, if this has measurement r, right, if I call this measurement r, and I tell you, you know, that this measurement right here is some known value, like I tell you, well, this is a cup that has radius 10, Okay, and it also has height, uh, say, 20. 
then that's R and this is H. So then we know a couple things about this. Right, so we know the volume. What is the volume of a cone? One third pi R squared H. Ah, that's something you ought to remember. Okay, so then <clears throat> another thing that you can see is that there's a big triangle, right? The big triangle, and inside of it, a little triangle. So when you have triangles inside of triangles, you should be thinking about what geometry thing that you studied before calculus. Starts with S. Similar triangles, right? Similar triangles. That is to say, the ratio of measurements of the inside of the circle, of the, in, of the inner triangle, should be the same as the ratio of measurements of the outside triangle. So then, I can say that here's one equation that involves the volume, and here's another equation that involves the measurements. So, R over H, right? R over H, for any R and for any H, should be equal to what ratio? 10 over 20. Does everybody see that? So this, this is from similar triangles. Okay, so then now, I'm not going to take this any further, I just want to make the last comment. All right, so in the, in the questions that I gave you, you know, I gave you one of the variables. You know, and then we said, oh no, we don't have the last measurement of the triangle. And then we said, oh yeah, we can figure it out with the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so on a question like this, it's again, it appears that I didn't give you all of the measurements. But actually, I did give you all of the measurements because you could say, for example, that R is one half H by a similar triangle's argument. Okay, so then you're going to have to channel all of your geometry knowledge to figure out these questions. Good luck. See you next week. <coughs>